as I say, um, Caroline Lucas is somebody who, who inspires me, inspires people within the Green Party, um, and in the broader left as well. Um, a great parliamentarian. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I, I introduce Caroline Lucas um, to speak to us this morning. But thank you. And I just um, was asked to say a few words of introduction. Um, and I was just going to reflect really about what strange and difficult times we live in. I wanted to talk a bit about the pandemic, um, which continues to affect every aspect of our lives, and then to identify some of the key lessons that might help us seize this extraordinary moment and ensure that we do indeed, in the famous phrase, build back better. But first, the truth is that the government's handling of this crisis has been a complete disaster. The public inquiry, which will inevitably happen, will have no shortage of material to cover. How 10 years of austerity left the NHS strong, let alone cope with the pandemic. How chronic fragmentation under the Health and Social Care Act, which Greens opposed from the very start, contributed to dangerous delays and disorganisation. How the learnings from exercise Cygnus were covered up and perhaps even worse, ignored. And how grotesque levels of inequality put people at ever greater risk. Now, of course, no government will get every decision right when they're facing challenges of this magnitude. But I think we have to understand how, at every point in this unfolding crisis, this government has made the wrong judgment calls and their unforced errors have cost lives. And that isn't about having the benefit of hindsight. It's about this government willfully choosing to ignore evidence in front of them. So we shouldn't wait for an inquiry after this pandemic to learn, learn the lessons from this disastrous approach because getting answers now can help save lives today. To take the track and trace operation as an example, surely it has to learn from the weaknesses of, of its current top-down centralized control. It's got to be driven at a local level, not contracted out to remote private sector companies, but instead having directors of public health and environmental health officers leading the delivery of a decentralized community-based operation. So I'm pleased to be part of a new all-party parliamentary group on coronavirus, which is launching its own public inquiry since the government is so resistant to launching one itself. We held our first evidence session on Wednesday and we'll be meeting throughout the summer so that we can present our findings early in the autumn. But the coronavirus pandemic has turned the world upside down. It's exposed the major weaknesses in our economy and the deep-seated inequalities in our society. With the most vulnerable hit hardest, whether that's people on low incomes or no incomes, whether that's black people or people of color. But what we do next could change everything. And I think the bottom line is there must be no return to normal because normal was intolerable for the vast majority of people as well as trashing our environment that we depend on. So it is vital that the recovery plan that happens next is one that decarbonizes our economy and also one that tackles these grotesque levels of inequality. And the stakes could scarcely be higher because as we all know only too well, the climate emergency is orders of magnitude more serious even than this awful virus. The Arctic is on fire. 2020 is on course to be the hottest year on record. And 16 of the 17 hottest years have all been since the year 2000. And the next decade is maybe the most significant in our history. Now we know, because we've been arguing it for over 10 years, that what we need is a transformative Green New Deal, which could create hundreds of thousands of new, decent and secure jobs as well as fixing an economy that is failing the vast majority of people and destroying the planet. And the case for that is more urgent than ever. Because in spite of the Prime Minister's Rooseveltian rhetoric, we need to be very clear that what he's offering is a pale, pale reflection of the real thing. So when it came to Boris Johnson's speech a few weeks ago, I made very clear in my speech in Parliament that it was an unforgivably squandered opportunity you know, there he was, the Prime Minister, claiming the mantle of Roosevelt, but his £5 billion accelerated capital spend 
was just 0.2% of GDP. It was less than £100 per person. It is a drop in the ocean compared to Roosevelt's economic stimulus, which represented nearly 40% of GDP. And to put that into a more contemporary context, Germany recently announced a £130 billion pound euro stimulus, which accounts for nearly 4% of their GDP. So failure to emulate Roosevelt's boldness is a massively wasted moment, particularly when borrowing has rarely been cheaper. And it's also economically illiterate. And the Oxford University study a few months ago from Joseph Stieglitz and Nicholas Stern was just the latest study showing that investment in a green economy makes economic as well as environmental sense because it's got higher returns on government spending, it has, uh, it's much more labor intensive, it's much faster, it's much cheaper. So now it feels like there is a real opportunity to press home the policies that we've been frankly banging on about for decades. I think there is more support for them now. And there is crucially a key moment right now where the direction that we take will make the world of difference. So now is the time, for example, to be really pressing home that there must be no bailouts to industries unless they pay their taxes in full, that their policies are in line with the Paris climate commitments, that they have things like a maximum pay ratio. And that means there should be no bailouts to people like EasyJet, instead of which they had an unconditional handout of 600 million pounds. We should be giving not a penny more to polluting activities. We need to cancel the 27 billion pound road building plan, for example. We should not be paying polluters to reboot a broken business model which stokes the climate emergency. We should be focusing bailouts instead on transitioning beyond fossil fuels while protecting and reskilling workers. We should be cancelling HS2 and using that money instead to electrify all lines to connect currently unconnected urban areas. We need to make buildings fit for the 21st century. We need to deliver clean power. We need to support and create the circular economy with a ban on burning peatland. We need a stronger agriculture and environment bill, which we are uh, amending as it goes through Parliament right now. And of course, we need to see far more things like, like tree planting and so on. We need to deliver a universal basic income to guarantee a predictable level of security for everyone. So we have an ambitious uh, set of policies to promote, but even that on their own are not enough. We need to do some deeper rewiring, repurposing and reimagining of our economy as well. That's something that Greta Thunberg told world leaders at the UN Climate Summit last year. As she said, we are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. Well, I think she was spot on. So this is the moment we need to repurpose our economy, to give top priority to the health and well-being of people and nature rather than GDP. We need a goal that is better than growth. And what's interesting is that some of the world's leading scientists are saying exactly the same thing. For example, a group of them delivered a warning to governments in April on exactly this. And I'll just give you a very brief quote from what they said. They said, as with the climate and biodiversity crises, Recent pandemics are a direct consequence of human activity, particularly our global financial and economic systems based on a limited paradigm that prizes economic growth at any cost. We have a small window of opportunity, they said, in overcoming the challenges of a current crisis to avoid sowing the seeds of future ones. And that's what I mean really about the next few months and weeks being so critical, because if we respond to the COVID pandemic by going down a road of build, 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 and by having a 27 billion pound road building plan, quite literally, then as I say, we will be locking ourselves into that high carbon future, which will be very difficult to get out of later on. So it's a really stark warning. And it emphasizes, I think, how now is the time to shift away from a growth economy and towards a well-being economy. And we need to listen to those scientists who have been warning for years that deforestation, exploitation of wild species, the unrelenting expansion of intensive farming and infrastructure and global air travel have created a perfect storm for the spillover of diseases from wildlife to people. So I wanted to tell you that we have an all party parliamentary group on limits to growth, which I chair. And this secretariat is provided by the wonderful Professor Tim Jackson, who you may know of as the author of a fantastic book called Prosperity Without Growth. 
He's based at the University of Surrey. And that all party group, and, and, and it's interesting that it is an all party group. So we did find a conservative to sign up to the idea of limits to growth. Uh, but that all party group is serving as a, as, a, as a locus in parliament, if you like, to promote those ideas of post growth economics. And the good news is that only 6% of the public want to return to the pre pandemic economy. The majority of people want the UK government to pursue health and well being instead of economic growth. And that's something I think that we can really move forward on. And in conclusion, I wanted to let you know as well that we've just reconstituted the all party group on the Green New Deal. And that's an all party group that I co-chair with Labour's Clive Lewis. And we've just retabled the very first Green New Deal private members bill, not sadly in the hope that we're actually gonna get it passed, but at least to have a kind of a green print to show how these plans can be legislated for. And that all party group, the Green New Deal all party group has also launched a far reaching inquiry of our own particularly focusing on how to, to reach out to hard to reach communities, how to get their views on how we build back better, how we ensure that that is done with people rather than to them, how we ensure it genuinely reflects their concerns, their needs and their priorities. And I urge you to look at the website, which is www.reset-uk.org and take the survey and share it with others. And we're very lucky that for this reset project, we've had an extraordinary amount of pro bono help on polling, on focus groups, on social media. 38 Degrees have taken it up and sent it to their members, and we've already had 50,000 responses from 38 Degree members. We've also held some more conventional evidence sessions. This week, for example, we were hearing from Kate Rayworth, the economist who devised the concept of donut economics. And while I'm at it, I warmly recommend her book of the same name if you've not come across it. And again, we'll be presenting the results of this kind of mass engagement with the public uh, in a report in the autumn. So genuinely, by way of conclusion now, I would simply say that an economy that has been focused on the extraction of profit and endless growth has eroded our collective immune system by undermining and under, uh, underfunding health and social care, impoverishing people here and around the world while also destroying climate and nature. But if we choose to, now is the moment that we can lay the groundwork for a fairer, greener recovery and build a society that's more equal and more resilient, where people and nature thrive and, when, and in which all of us have a real say. And that's the real prize. That's the, the choice we face right now. And for us as Greens, I think our challenge is to build a bigger movement for change, starting, for example, with all of those people who've been clapping outside their homes so that people understand that, yes, NHS workers want thanks, but even more, what they want is proper resourcing. The people working in our care homes deserve praise, but even more, they deserve a functioning, integrated, publicly paid for health and social care system, not yet more privatisation. And that never again must we leave the public realm so perilously weakened, since frankly, we rely on it for almost everything. Never again can we let this grossly undertaxed and unequal country tolerate an economy that leaves half the population unable to weather the storms. And hopefully never again, crucially, can we elect a government that commits the greatest crime by refusing to prepare for an even greater emergency, the climate emergency. How can we get our message to people outside of the green world? Well, that is a, a good question. And I guess what I would say to that is that um, I think we just need to be really active in our communities and to take that message um, wherever you know, wh wherever we're meeting people, whether that's at, you know, if we're volunteering at a food bank or in our workplaces, I just think there is a real sense among people who perhaps have never thought very much about, about, about this kind of agenda before. There is a sense that people just don't want to go back to what was normal and, and that they want to know that something different is possible. And of course, we're not going to have all the answers, but the fact that we've been asking the questions for longer than most means that we've probably got a bit of a head start on, on some of the answers. And just some of the most basic things, I think most people would recognize that giving massive bailouts to highly polluting industries is just crazy. That people recognize now that having ignored experts and pretended that they had nothing useful to contribute now seems an incredibly reckless thing to do. And so I think what we just need to do is to um, have a bit more courage and to have those conversations which with people that perhaps we think are not going to be agreeing with us, but I have a strong sense that an awful lot of them at the very least, we'll agree with our uh, analysis of the problems and could well 
actually agree far more than we might predict with, with many of our answers as well. So I think it's about going out to organisations, you know, getting and getting the opportunity to go and talk, talk to the Women's Institute, for example, or the Rotary Club or, 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 or wherever, and just having more courage than we've ever had before, that now what we're talking about is, is likely to land better than it, than it ever has done before. Uh, Claudia Fisher, question from Stephen Williams. I agree that now is the real opportunity to build back better and create a Green New Deal. The government drive towards mega-sized unitary authorities remote from the electorate seems to be an example of detaching government from local electorates. How much do you feel that the current crisis creates an opportunity for centralisation of power and threatening democracy from those who don't want to seize the opportunities you've outlined? Again, another really good question, and I'd certainly agree that ever, ever more centralisation is a real threat, because when power is <clears throat> remote from where people feel that they can influence it, <clears throat> then it's a uh, then there's a sense of disempowerment, disengagement, and, and people just don't engage locally. And so it feels more urgent than ever that we oppose these mega-sized unitary uh, authorities, that we try to make sure that power is where we can influence it. And if they go ahead anyway, then in a sense, we have to set up, I think, you know, our, our own ways of, of, of trying to influence things, whether that's getting more involved in parish councils or whether it's uh, trying to set up citizens' assemblies in areas where we can do that. Um, I think, in fact, there is quite a critique of centralisation right now when you see what's been happening, happening with the pandemic. So much of what the government's done wrong has been as a direct result of the centralisation of power and the track and, track and trace uh, issue is just the, the, the most recent. But also, for example, the procurement of PPE just going through a, a small number of big companies was shown to be a complete disaster. So I think the more that we can point out that these um, ever larger bodies don't actually deliver for local people. If we lose that battle, as I say, we're going to have to get more imaginative around things like citizens assemblies and so forth. Uh, but uh, it, 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 I think, yeah, we, we need to be we need to be pushing that. Should we be shouting more about planning system reform? Yes, we should. And again, I think that is something where people will be receptive because People want to say on the changes that are happening in their localities. Um, we've seen that uh, Boris Johnson is talking about this thing called Project Speed, uh, where basically he's talk talking about tearing up the protections that um, our local spaces have had until now. And yet it's been interesting through the pandemic, I think there's been a real recognition that people care so much about local green space. You know, when it was suggested that um, parks in London might close because people weren't socially distancing, there was a massive outcry because people recognised that access to green space is actually a really key issue, issue of social justice. If you happen to live in a large house with a big garden, then, then that's great. But for the people who don't have that, then access to local green space is, is massively important. Um, and we should be, I think, really pushing our policies around all new developments being within, um, having within uh, walking distance green space. I think the whole idea of the so-called 15 minute neighborhoods where we're talking about planning in such a way that all of the um, basic things that you might need are within a 15 minute walking distance um, uh, scope. I, I think all of those actually will land well right now because people recognize just how important it is to have that space uh, and to protect it. So yes, definitely we need to be fighting those planning reforms. However green other parties are, this is Isabel Thurston. They are desperate to get the economy going again via Gatwick and road building. It's so disheartening to be in local government with them. Yes, I can imagine that. And also just so hypocritical, so, so logically inconsistent. I mean, how dare they claim to be green and at the same time back expansion of Gatwick or Heathrow or any other airport. And I still find it quite extraordinary that this is a government that is um, committed to 27 billion pounds of road building. You know, Rishi Sunak, the chancellor, was absolutely, uh, you know, crowing about the fact that this was the largest road building plan uh, in English history, uh, which seems an extraordinary thing. 